Hello and welcome. I'm Kamla. My guest today is Ken Florence. He's the Vice President of Content Delivery at Netflix, which is based in Los Gatos. Is Los Gatos in Silicon Valley, Ken? I would say it's the extreme southern end. of It depends on who you ask. <laughs> We're pushing the envelope yeah, here. exactly. <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you. So how does it how do you make this magic happen? You're vice president of content delivery. What mm -hmm. does that mean? Uh, it means we need to get the movies and TV shows into people's houses. So where Netflix delivers movies and TV shows across the internet. Um, and in order to do that, we need to actually be streaming a file from a server somewhere, a computer somewhere, uh, into your home. Mm. And since Netflix has you know more than 80 million uh, subscribers around the world that's a that's a fairly large job and we need to um, have uh, very good intentional designs around how to scale the internet to accommodate that kind of traffic and so um, it's it's really about how do we get that content close to people so that's your job that's my job what keeps you awake at night uh, the only thing that keeps me awake at night is if my daughter's out late um, uh, there's nothing about work that keeps me awake at night. No buffering? Yeah, we, well, we, we, you know, we have a, a fantastic team of folks in content delivery. Netflix has a fantastic group of engineers uh, on the client side, on the media pipeline side. Um, so there are definitely always interesting concerns and challenges, but I also have, you know, a great team and great confidence in them. So I, I get to sleep, which is nice. Okay. So would you explain to us how, how do you... Uh, deliver your content to to me either on my iPhone mm -hmm. or on my uh, you know Apple TV. Right. So you are connected to some network. If you're at home, you might Comcast. be using yeah. So you might be using Comcast as your ISP at home, and in that case, then that means that Netflix's network somehow has to be connected to Comcast network. And of course, um, again, Netflix is delivering uh, content at quite a scale, so we don't want to be delivering that from you know, one central location. We want the content as close to you at home as possible. So um, the way the internet works is there, there are lots of locations typically, typically called internet exchanges where lots of different networks meet. Big data centers, nondescript buildings, you know, full of racks of computers and network equipment. And so um, my team designs customized servers to install either in these big internet exchange locations or actually within ISP networks very close to uh, the regions and wh where people are watching the content. Is that what is called Netflix in a box? Yes, so one of the things we do is design uh, a couple of different types of servers that store all of the content. So the lo my local ISP would have it, and that's where I'm getting my content from. Yeah, exactly. You know, in an ideal case, it's, that content is not traveling too many miles because, as you can imagine, you know, if we tried to serve content from one central location, there would need to be massive capacity um, coming out of that location into kind of smaller and smaller branches. Um, but if you move that content kind of downstream into those smaller locations, you know, from a giant metro area to a smaller section of that metro area or from a country to a city, um, then you're getting that content closer to people and that content is traveling over less of that, uh, less segments of that network and therefore using less capacity on those networks. So binge watching is a term that came, I think, after we all saw House of Cards. Mm -hmm. What kinds of challenges, uh, or what kinds, I'm saying kinds, because I don't know if you have challenges right. or not, when, yeah. when we do binge watching on our end, right. what does it mean for you? Well, one of the interesting things, again, you know, my team's whole mission is really, how do we give you a fantastic Netflix experience and elim you know, reduce or eliminate congestion on the internet? Mm. And so, again, part of that is getting it as close to you as possible. And then it's the question of, what are we getting as close to you as possible? So having the right content in the right location at the right time is really what, what we're uh, charged with doing. And so um, one of the good analogies for this is, you know, freeways and cars, et cetera, right? So um, one of the things we do with our content, like House of Cards as an example, is we know that's going to be a popular show. So we make sure that that, that, that the, the trucks uh, drive in the middle of the night across the highway, not during congested times, to get that content 
uh, close to you and then serve it. So in, in the example of a show like House of Cards, one of the things we do is make sure that that content is pre-positioned throughout the network the night before so that you know when it goes live and you're able to click play on Netflix that content is already sitting at So a do you have duplicate copies because there's going to be such a strong demand for a show like House of Cards? Yes, yeah, so House of Cards may be uh, distributed onto every single of the thousands of servers that we have around the world. Hmm. How many hours of streaming do you serve every day? Do you have a number? Yeah, I think the last time I looked it was more than 125 million hours a day. 125 million? Yes. That's a lot. That's a lot of hours My mind day. can't even process that number. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's a lot of people being entertained. So sure. you said that, I have a little, yeah. this is my external hard drive. Mm -hmm. So this Netflix in a box that yeah. you have, how big would that be? It how depends. So um, one of the first things we did uh, when we started to design the servers that we use now, um, the Netflix content delivery system is called Open Connect. Mm. And so we call the servers Open Connect Appliances or mm. OCAs. Um, and so one of the first things we did was we need a lot of these in a single server. Uh, and actually no commercial server uh, that was available had, you know, basically our idea was how many of these could we stuff in a server and have a network connection on it. So how um, many TBs are we talking about? Uh, Terabytes? I uh, yeah, I think the current um, server has, I think, I think the largest one we produce is 200 terabytes. 200 uh, terabytes. In, in, a, in a single server. And so that, we ended up, actually there's some folks in San Mateo um, that started a company for online backups called Backblaze. And we are, some of the original discussions we had were with those guys because they had very similar requirements to us. Um, and it really was stacking a bunch of the, you know, typically in a server, there would be uh, hot plug hard drives that go in the front. And instead we stacked a bunch of them you know, in a box like this, so we could just get as many hard drives as possible. Uh, and then, if, then there's the issue of how do you cool them, and you know, how many fans do you need to have? And um, but it's really just this um, this idea of again, how much storage can you attach to a network? I've never seen anybody be so happy talking about yeah. storage. And <laughs> yeah. network. Well, you know, the, the happy thing is people get to watch TV shows and movies, and it, it generally works really well. So, you know, I, it's nice to work at Netflix because most people who have Netflix really like it, so they're enthusiastic about it. Uh, and, you know, because we've spent a lot of time working on these designs, et cetera, it tends to work pretty well. So typically as part of my job, I don't get a lot of people, you know, kind of complaining at me, which is nice. When did you join Netflix? Uh, 2003. And so, how? Um, I had been at uh, this really interesting uh, company uh, that was involved in part of the, in the kind of the first big internet bubble. Um, it was a company called Navisite that was uh, a, a managed hosting provider. So uh, I almost think of it as an early version of the cloud, mm. um, you know, cloud hosting where p if people had an application, we would create infrastructure and 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 provide you know it, you know deliver that application over the internet. Um, and so you worked in a data center. Yeah. So I, I worked at this company that was really about helping people scale internet applications, mm. um, and you know learned a lot about how to do that in in the kind of early days, ninety eight to two thousand three, uh, and then after the first big internet bubble burst. Um, the, the business model of that company was quite challenged because, you know, they were renting capacity to a lot of people. They were leasing the gear to provide that capacity. And the then, then the telecom meltdown yes, happened. Yeah, the economics got quite difficult. Um, and so some of the folks that had worked for me at that company had actually gone on to Netflix and they said, oh, you should come over here. It's fun. Um, so I came over to Netflix when... You know, I forget how many subscribers we had, but well under a million subscribers. Oh, under uh, a million. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was And now it's tiny. 80 million. Yes, yes. So you've really million. seen the company grow. Yes, grow massively over the past 13 years. Yeah. So, and you came in as what? Uh, I actually, <laughs> that was a funny story because, um, again, one of my friends had said, oh, you should come work here. And the only job that I saw that they were looking for was a manager of their kind of desktop computing team. And so I... I sent in my resume and I showed up for an interview and I said, the first thing I should tell you is I don't really want to do this job that I'm interviewing for, um, but here's some other things I can do. Can, let's talk about that and see if that's interesting. Uh, and so what we agreed was that um, 
I would originally come in to kind of help them establish um, just the kind of uh, an operations center. Like, you know, they were already shipping lots of DVDs, but they didn't have a very elaborate way to kind of monitor progress of how things were going during the day and what was succeeding and what was failing. So that was really my original job is to kind of set up monitoring systems and, uh, you know, kind of help the operations go smoothly. Why did the hiring manager hire you? Because you already told him these, you know, you're not interested in the job. So yeah. I'm curious, would you hire somebody like that now if you were in the hiring position? I might, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I find that um, the uh, people that are interested, motivated, curious, have relevant experience. Um, you know, so, sometimes we hire people, uh, the, the, the term we use is opportunistic hire. You know, if there's a great person that shows up on your doorstep, um, and you have great work you think that person can do, then, you know, you hire them. It's not, and, and even, even when you don't have a I'm showing kind of up at, at plan. Netflix. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> we'll have a chat. But uh, let's go back to how you got started in technology. Mm -hmm. You grew up on the East Coast. I did. Uh, so do you remember tinkering with uh, gadgets as a young no, kid? No, I was much more interested in, you know, philosophy and reading and literature. Um, Who introduced you to philosophy? Uh, when I was a kid, my dad brought home, somebody was like selling or getting rid of a bunch of books, a collection of books, and he brought home these boxes of books, and I remember one of them was the co complete works of Plato. Um, and How I, old were you? I really became fascinated with that. I don't know, 11 or 10, something like that. And what did your dad do? Uh, he was a dry cleaner. And how did he, so one of his clients was getting rid of books or something? Yeah, I think so. I think somebody was like cleaning out their attic or something. Okay, yeah. so then you started reading Plato. Yeah, I started reading Plato. I really enjoyed it. I, I had never, I, well, I just remember being kind of struck by, wow, this is someone who, you know, kind of takes these philosophical arguments and tries to understand, you know, how does life work and what's the meaning of our existence? That so how did you go from reading Plato at the age of 11 to being VP of content delivery of Netflix. What was that path like? Well, you know, it's a, you know, it's a kind of an interesting story, I guess. The um, part of whatever it was that made me like stuff like that at a young age also, um, well, like, like I was saying, you know, people that we might be interested in hiring, you know, I think I had this kind of curiosity, this really built-in fundamental curiosity about life. Um, and that also made me not fit very well in a school environment. Like, I, I've always loved learning, but I've never really particularly loved um, classrooms Ro or... Rote learning. Exactly. You know, I, I always wanted to learn what I was interested in, not what somebody else was trying to get me to learn. So what were you interested in besides philosophy? Um, Literature. Um, I loved uh, reading Tolkien and stuff like that when I was a kid. Um, and so, anyway, I, I halfway through high school dropped out. Um, decided, Your parents were okay with that? I don't know. I mean, they came to terms with it. Um, and and I, I would say my my parents were always um, was very supportive, trying to find a way. You know, I'm sure I was a very challenging kid to raise. Um, you don't but, seem uh, like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah, you, you should probably, you know, you could interview my mom sometime and she would probably tell the whole story. So you dropped out of school to yep. go uh, do the Grateful Dead uh, yeah, concert series? Yeah, you know, we, we had, Melissa and I had, you know, kind of gone around the country a few times. That's your uh, then girlfriend. Then girlfriend, now wife. Um, and uh, so we had gotten this taste of, wow, there's this huge country out there. There's all these possibilities. We, we grew up in this, um, you know, suburb of Washington, D.C. Um, that, that seemed a little stultifying to us, I think, at 18 years old. Um, and so I moved all the way across the country to Eugene, Oregon, because that's where Ken Kesey ended up. And it seemed like, you know, that must be a good place for hippies to live. So Ken Kesey, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Exactly. Yeah, and he was kind of a counterculture hero that part of that whole um, Grateful Dead. Ken, looking scene. at you, you would never think you were a counterculture person. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I, I had pretty long hair at the time. <laughs> really? Yeah, oh, yeah. And you wore tie and dye, tie -dye t shirts? Oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, Birkenstocks? Yes, I did have a few pairs of Birkenstocks. 
Wow. Absolutely. And lots of, uh, and did you drive a Volkswagen? Yeah, our first, our first big cross country, round the country trip, we, we drove 10,000 miles in a bug, 1974 bug. So it kind of fits that you now play the sitar. Yes. <laughs> yeah. and, and then you're also a practicing Buddhist. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen? How did you become a Buddhist? Well, if we fast forward um, a few years, so I'd, I'd been living in Oregon, my then girlfriend, now wife, Melissa, uh, moved out to Oregon with me and, and talked me into um, applying to UCSC with her. Santa Cruz. University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, and so even though I hadn't finished high school, um, you know, I, I, I took ACTs and wrote letters and they were kind enough to let me in. Um, and so we bo both started in, in Santa Cruz. And, and I remember a time when we were going to school you know, and I was studying philosophy and literature, et cetera, and I, I, had, I had an interest in reading about Buddhism. I had taken um, a great world religions class by uh, a, an awesome professor named Noel King, who's since passed. Um, and I, I happened to see the Dalai Lama uh, being interviewed on TV by John McLaughlin, you know, this kind of hard-bitten Washington, D.C., Reporter and the McLaughlin, uh, the McLaughlin group. They yeah, exactly have. right. Issue was, number one. <laughs> right, issue number one. It was kind of a Saturday morning political news show, and of course, having grown up in the D.C. area, and he was interviewing the Dalai Lama. He was interviewing the Dalai Lama, so it, it was watching that interview was this tremendous contrast between, um, you know, this this kind of uh, very um, kind of locked down personality and this other person who was just very wide open. Um, and uh, kind and present, uh, and that really struck me. And it, you know, it, I, I think the realization for me at that time was that um, you know, Buddhism isn't just something you can read about; it's something you actually have to practice. So you've been a practicing Buddhist for how long? Um, so as a result of that, I ended up looking around for somebody to practice with and uh, met a Tibetan Lama who was living in the area, happened to be living in the area. Santa Cruz. In Santa Cruz. He was in, in uh, SoCal at the time. Uh, Lama Dujum George, he's now in, in Dallas. He runs a, a center in Dallas now. And uh, so uh, I met him and started studying with him in 1991, so about 25 years ago. And what does it entail to be a Buddhist for you? Did you go to church as a kid? I did go to church as a kid, and um, again, like the, you know, that kind of deep curiosity about life and why we're here and stuff. So, um, I think what what interested me in Buddhism is it's ultimately uh, a very kind of rational, experiential approach to uh, you know issues of you know fundamental questions of existence. Um, you know, one of the things the Buddha said was. You know, don't don't uh, believe what I'm teaching you just because it's me. You should take every teaching as if it's gold. You weigh it, you scratch it, you analyze it, you make sure that it's valuable, and then you incorporate it. Um, and so, it's it, Buddhism just provides a structure for kind of um, understanding your own experience. I think. So it appeals to you because it does not recommend rote learning. Yes. On the other hand, it. It puts the ball in your coat and says, "Go with it." Right, you know, and and I'm, you know, there's again some kind of fundamental um, approaches to existence, like understanding uh, that everything is based on cause and effect, understanding that um, everything is impermanent, you know, and these are very valuable things to kind of deeply internalize, and then the practice of meditation, the practice of um, uh, kind of watching your own mind and understanding how you react as a person uh, and, and kind of providing that space for yourself, um, that space, the, the same space that helps you understand yourself, helps you relate to other people uh, and understand the difference between um, you know, the person you're speaking with as just a concept that you're pasting on top of them uh, and the real individual. That's there. I, you know, this is something that I think all of us, um, you know, we have our spouses, we have our children, we have our friends, and it's so easy uh, to relate to kind of a projection of who we think our son is or who we think our daughter is and forget to really uh, be there with that person and find out from them who they are.
So that, that's this whole notion of being in the now. Yes, yes. How has Buddhism changed you? Uh, I think it's, like I said, really helped me understand, you know, it, 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 the practice of meditation of just sitting there with yourself and observing your mind really helps you understand where do you know emotions come from where do these reactions come from why do i react this way to certain things uh, and not other things or when i do react you know when i you know there's always these basic hu human emotions of anger of love of joy of sadness um you know can you can you really just experience that um, if I suddenly become angry, you know, there's nothing wrong with anger. It's just like a, a storm blowing across the ocean. But if I decide that because I'm angry, it's your fault, you made me angry, and then I start to kind of create this whole structure around why you made me angry and, you know, visit all that on you, that's a completely different thing. So I think it, it has really helped me, um, like I said, understand the difference between um, you know, the real experience of presence and reality and a lot of this, you know, imagined stuff that we can paste on top of it. So let's stay with your counterculture yes. personality. So to round it up, you also played the sitar. I do. How did that happen? You played the guitar as a kid. Yeah, I, I, I think I got my first guitar at seven or eight years old. Um, I've always loved music. I've always loved... Um, a, a, the guitar has really, you know, got me attached to stringed instruments, so I really love stringed instruments. Um, and, you know, r I think there's something about um, music as kind of a, a nonverbal communication. You know, so much of our lives we go around, you know, telling ourselves stories inside our heads, and there's something really wonderful about music as a way to, you know, express yourself and 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 understand your own emotions, other people's emotions, hear other people's expressions um, in a way that's not kind of locked up in language in that way. And um, so I, at some point along the way, you know, probably from uh, watching the Woodstock movie or something, I was exposed to Ravi Shankar and just completely amazed at, um, I mean, he's, he's one of the great musicians worldwide, I think, of the past century. Um, uh, just completely amazed at his talent and and the unbelievable expression uh, to be found in that kind of music. So that started me on this whole journey of trying to learn something about uh, this tremendously deep subject, which is Indian music. And um, because my wife uh, knew that I loved that kind of music, she surprised me to no end by uh, uh, buying me a sitar for my birthday one year, which was unquestionably the best birthday present I ever had. And so that got you started? That got me started. And so you learned, you, do you still learn the sitar? Do you play it? I play it every night. Um, yeah, I, so I started, you know, because it's, having known how to play guitar definitely helped me, like I had some way of relating to a stringed instrument, but a sitar is just an incredibly remarkable ancient piece of musical technology and so um, I really had very little idea how to approach it. I, I had the great fortune of um, there's an uh, amazing sitar uh, player and teacher that lives right down the street from me, Ashwin Batish, uh, in Santa Cruz. And so I took lessons with Ashwin and his son Kishav, who's an amazing tabla player and drummer, uh, for a few years, enough to get me started um, so that I could really kind of explore on my own. So we never touched upon how you became a techie. Yes. So how did that happen? So you went and explored, you did all these uh, different things, counterculture things. Right. But what was it that you did that got you to Netflix? You, we mentioned Navi's site. Yeah, so um, I was going to UCSC. I was, uh, you know, Melissa and I were really kind of supporting ourselves. And so I um, had to get a job. Ended up having a friend that was uh, working at Cabrillo College, so the community college south of Santa Cruz in Aptos, California. So I was, you know, attending UCSC but working at Cabrillo, and um, just working in, in a warehouse there. You know, the, the warehouse where all the textbooks come into and all the copier paper and just moving stuff around. And it was a good job for a college kid. Um, and then over time, 
Uh, it, they, they provided us with a computer so that we could start to keep track of inventory, and so I got to start to play with this thing uh, that did remarkable stuff, and the most remarkable thing uh, to me that the computer did was it could talk to other computers. Um, did, did you explore the talk function? Yeah, so, uh, y right, you know, the chatting, Unity, yeah. um, uh, all kinds of stuff that this thing could do, and really that was the time when um, the campus network was a novel network, network, which was you know nothing to do with the internet. But the internet as a as a thing, like the commercial internet, I think is dated to about 1992. Um, so the internet as a thing really started taking off around the time I was there and going from kind of an academic and a research network to a broader thing. And um, the astronomy department, I remember, really wanted to kind of connect to the internet. There was all this stuff happening in the world of astronomy, and so. Uh, I knew the folks that were working in the computer lab. They got me an IP address for this computer, and then you know when I could realized I could uh, ping a computer in Japan, that I was just hooked. Like this thing could help me transcend time and space. Um, and so from there, I, I kind of finagled my way out of the warehouse and into the um, uh, computing resource center, the, the center that supported all the the faculty computing and the and the networks, etc. Uh, and that's really where I started to learn. And so you're self-taught? Yes, yeah. I, I, I learned on the job is a better way to put it. I, I have had the privilege of working with many, many talented people um, who were patient enough to answer my questions uh, and, and, and you know, really kind of grew into it. It's, it's funny because um, you know, at various uh, times I've thought about, wow, would, would my life have been different if I figured out I like technology and went to school for it, but you know, really everything was evolving in real time at the time I was working in that field. So uh, I think if I went to school at that time, I would have been learning something that was happening a couple of years ago versus you know, just watching it all unfold in front of me, which was really fun. Would you give a chance to somebody, if they came to you today at Netflix and presented a resume with your kind of resume when you were in your 20s? Um, possibly, it's, you know, Netflix has a partic particular culture and um, one of the things that we prize in that culture is really hiring, you know, fully formed adults who can be very autonomous. Mm. Um, and so it can be challenging for a very young person, but, um, you know, if the person is, um, uh, you know, incredibly talented, um, and curious. And curious, then, you know, I would certainly speak with them. And, um, s like, if, if, if you took my resume and fast-forwarded it, uh, you know, a few years, maybe, you know, and I don't know if age has more to do with it than kind of experience, um, but I would certainly look at somebody who had relevant experience without particular regard to their education. Um, educations can be great and valuable things, but um, what I've found is, uh, you know, curiosity, um, intelligence, passion, um, these are the qualities you're really looking for in somebody who's, who's just going to do a fantastic job at whatever they do. Ken, it was a real pleasure to talk to you and thank you so much for explaining what you do as VP uh, of content delivery at Netflix. You know, uh, you certainly have a very interesting job and you make our lives easy, I think, because we get to binge watch. Thank you, Kamala. <laughs> And thank you for watching. We'll be back again with another edition of our show. And if you missed any of our shows, you can catch them on YouTube.